Well, yeah, okay. So there's many ways to think about that. The way I think about it is, um, it seems like the only strategy for all the L1s from last cycle was to persuade people to come to their chain by saying that we are faster, um, cheaper, uh, all those features of the chain basically, or benefits. Um, but everyone was doing it. So there, there's, it, it's not, you can't convince someone to come to your chain with those arguments. You got to network hack it in the way. So that's why we wanted to try something different with, with Zen in the fact that we come to your chain instead, no matter what it is, because Zen is based on first principles and we got a lot of pushback at first. We launched Zen on Ethereum and then we wanted to go to Binance and people were saying, hey, this is supposed to be pure first principles crypto. You shouldn't even interact with something like Binance, which is super centralized. That was the sentiment from the community back then. But we said, no, if we want to change, we have to go to them, to their world. Because, and we shouldn't be afraid of that because we can trust the code. Um, the first principles is in the code, in the trustless code. Um, and it turns out that this is a very great way to you get a lot of benefits from doing this. So first of all, you come to them, you create a presence there, which creates pathways for them to come back to us as well. Um, but the many side benefits of the strategy is you really get a great insight as to how all of these chains work, how they operate, what is good with them and what is very bad with them. Dodge chain, they, um, censored our contract, okay? And GMI. Okay, X, uh, manipulated the gas fees, okay? And GMI, they're not gonna, like, uh, their solution, whatever they're building, is obviously not what we are looking for. Um, we saw the effects on gas, on Ethereum, Polygon crashed, uh, Bitcoin, when we launched VMPX. Uh, it was the first time in Bitcoin's history where the miners got more paid from transaction fees than from block rewards. Uh, Sats per virtual byte went up over 600. It was crazy. Yeah. For, for like eight hours. Yeah. So, it, and then you realize, okay, it's all about block space. And then you start researching uh, what works really well and what does not work really well based on uh, our experiences with Zen, which uh, consumes the whole block. It's designed to do that in a way. And this is already the way that ordinals are interacting directly with the chain. That's exactly what we did. You're just interacting with a contract, an immutable contract with no admin keys, with your self custody all the time. You decide the value. Delayed gratification um, based on your time preference of, of value, um, you choose how much you want to get. And it's an ARB between what you're paying in gas today and the time that you choose that you mint versus the price of the asset then. So uh, the rules of that game is something that nobody can manipulate because it's uh, not attached to a centralized organization. And it's crazy because this is what crypto was supposed to be about, but it, it's surprisingly few protocols back then when we launched Sam who did this, uh, really. Now with ordinals, it's why it's so great because it becomes more of a standard way of releasing a token in a fair, free mint. Yeah, uh, it, I think it focuses on more of the right things to like community creation, story creation, culture rather than microphone. Yeah, I was saying uh, community culture creation rather than uh, a payday for the founder. Because like the previous tokens, like uh, l let's say like SHIB, for example, like the founders clearly had a lot of SHIB and they did all kinds of, you know, interesting things like send half, half of the uh, supply to Vitalik just to right. attract attention, which is kind of cool, but it's it's not really like a long-term uh, plan for like crypto adoption. And if we use the meta idea that we really want to onboard the world, uh, we want to have the best economics in the way of fairness so that 
everybody get to feel that they can win in a fair way. It's not that their decisions will automatically make them a winner, but at least if they think they don't have the tax of the founder, you know, taking a bunch Unnecessary of... Unnecessary uncertainty. Well, well, yeah, I mean, like, it, you more like you're focusing on what you can do with, uh, with crypto rather than at what point will you be, will you be dumped by the founder? Yeah. Right. So that's like very, very different uh, aspects. So, and obviously we want to have the fastest chain, cheapest fees, the most interesting onboarding mechanism, which is like 12 EVM chains plus Bitcoin. Uh, no one has done the onboarding method fairly in that particular way. It was always kind of like, let's do something weird uh, with uh, with the distribution let's give like some entity a lot of coins or do some sort of uh, a burn mechanism or some sort of a rotating thing that like feeds some kind itself of difficulty to get the other token yeah i mean like to in, to engage in the process but like in, in our particular way we basically said that here's the monopoly money like so to speak and this monop monopoly money may be worth something if that currency is actually used as currency for other things. So with X1, for example, then being everywhere and other tokens being everywhere, those are the currency tokens that you can then uh, receive utility for. Like we, when we launched, we haven't promised utility at launch for any token, right? But then we decided that those tokens are so pure in the way how crypto is and, and it's been designed to be very, very similar to Bitcoin, for example, why not build utility for it at the later date? Which like, if you asked me 12 months ago, I didn't think we would be building a blockchain or exploring a possibility of launching a blockchain that can compete with the big guys. But having Zen everywhere allowed us really to dive deep into tech and all of the elements that make them potentially not scalable in the future with, with further adoption of the world. And so, so that's where we went from thinking of protocol level to infrastructure level and starting analyzing all of these chains. But it started just because you have a necessity, something else needs to be built. Yeah, well, because it's... Because what's out there today does not satisfy. Well, well, well let's just say that uh, I, don't, I haven't seen any chain that's actually ready for like quadrupling of the population of uh, uh, crypto peeps right. or uh, crypto denizens like yeah. so so to speak and then we analyzed 13 different chains in the way that we tested them empirically stress tested these chains to the yeah, max you, what you they could handle that's how you learn and then you do that with 13 EBM chains in bitcoin and solana go deep in how they are having their da layer consensus layer uh, and and uh, validation layer yeah well, I think, the execution layer. well, I think the major narrative, we already know that the existing uh, chain technology is not going to scale. The only way to scale Ethereum, for example, is through fragmentation. You drop the fees for rollups and then you let everybody build rollup application specific chains that are technically never going to be decentralized. So it's like satellites, uh, money processors that do certain things, kind of like lightning network that's like super centralized for Bitcoin. It is the same thing, except Ethereum uh, is basically because it's programmable money to begin with, it has solidity, and in EVM, it allows uh, other interested parties to make money by creating a layer on top of Ethereum. But the problem is that if Ethereum becomes this central core, similar to Bitcoin, as uh, basically a store of value and it has pro programmable capabilities, the problem is is that as more and more activity leaves Ethereum, it ends up in centralized satellites yeah. that are acting as applications that can censor anything you do. Modular approach, yeah. use atomic composability. Yeah, so if, you, if you're if you there to gamble, by all means, you can gamble anywhere. You can even gamble, well, obviously on centralized exchanges that are not chains. But what's happening here is that the, the those application-specific chains like Optimism, Arbitrum, base so on and so forth all the layer twos all they're doing is they're building a better ux versus ethereum but they really are centralized exchanges themselves right so what ends up happening is that more people get pushed away from ethereum which is decentralized into those outer 
layer two chains, but really ending up on centralized exchanges for, for gambling purposes at all. And uh, removing this whole concept of uh, censorship resistance. Um, well, immutability, obviously, because those chains can change the, the layer. Yeah, because the problem with that is that they become the tentacles for adoption. So the people are entering through uh, these chains before they enter through the Ethereum route, which means that they end up in a world which is having less of the first principles than Ethereum yeah. has. I mean, like, technically, you could have a vault on Ethereum. So how do you ensure that that's... You, you could have a vault on Ethereum with, with like 95% of your assets and then gamble with the 5% every day by shifting it back into this like exchange driven chain, like Arbitrum Optimism, whatever, right? But the point is like any sort of longer term projects that, for example, give you yield or do other interesting things, it's, al it's almost like irrelevant to, to use those or, de or even develop, if I'm a developer, knowing that the code is really not immutable, mm -hmm. right? So what is the point of longevity of your assets or a store of value if it's only focused on short-term gambling? And I'm not saying that gambling is bad or anything. Anybody can do whatever they want. But the point is, like, let's not confuse the layer two as a, as a solution for decentralization because it isn't. Mm -hmm. So... You're you're still you're you're moving more towards social consensus, but uh, social consensus in the world we have today, like for example, we all agree like somehow that central central bank should exist and make certain decisions that we do not understand, and yet we accept it as reality. Yeah. So that's social consensus, where other humans call the shots, and crypto is kind of really was supposed to be the sort of like an opposite thing. Yeah. Well, not an opposite, but enable you to not to deal with all those things. So. so that's why we go with a monolithic approach instead of a modular, but it's a monolithic approach with modularity inside of it. Like one thing is that uh, you can inherit all the benefits that can go on in an L2, but incorporate that inside of the L1. So full decentralization for storage and contract execution monolithically with the speeds of uh, L2 chains. Yeah. Or faster. Or faster, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's a it's a L two roll up tech inside of the L one. It's like uh, you know, and I don't know if you know, but it used to be um, the CPU was only one core, and then they they made it a dual core where your operating system can run in parallel. Mm across many different things. So this is similar to what we're implementing. We're pushing the execution layer outside of the consensus layer, but mm -hmm. yet making the consensus to be almost instant uh, using the uh, DAG technology. Right. Uh, and, the, and the DAG uh, tech uh, enables the re relatively small number of nodes come up with the consensus and yet maintain full distribution and decentralization yeah. because you're always rotating them. So that's what makes it super interesting because uh, finality is actually made at the time of the transaction execution, not later like it's done uh, in Ethereum pretty much every other chain. Yeah, you want, you want, you want fi uh, finality p to be fast. Uh, so and, and, fair, one, and fair. And, fa and the, when you do that, you can also optimize that using transformers and AI. In the, and then you optimize the consensus model itself, uh, which is very cool. Yeah, super exciting stuff. Yeah, so we just passed uh, 100 million uh, transactions. I think I mentioned it before, but um, really cool way to benchmark a chain. We're just running, been running transactions as fast as we could for like the last month and uh, we hit 100 million. So, but during all of this, we also created uh, Sandblocks, the proof of work element of X1, which was interesting because while we were uh, researching all the other chains empirically with Zen and studying, setting up validators uh, with their chains, really feeling them out, uh, we also uh, were curious about, well, you created a miner uh, in a weekend and wanted to try it out. And that led to a huge community gathering uh, and the benefits of uh, mining with uh, proof of work.
So then we were thinking about should a proof of work, proof of stake hybrid be uh, a way to go. Or help each other. Or help each other in any way. way because there's benefits and uh, uh, well, downsides with both, uh, both systems. Well, it's the, not crystal clear. Well, so the, what if you could use both of them? Right. Well, I think the surprising benefit really was the fact that we don't have to ask people from other chains sell their crypto to actually to get into X1. Yeah. With proof of work, you're just paying for a miner and you commit to some period of time to mine. You get your XNM, which is minted for you on chain, and that's the representation of your uh, true proof of work because there's no way that you can algorithmically cheat and come up with more hashes. Yeah. And so I don't think really, uh, uh, I mean, like obviously the pure proof of work uh, chains like Caspa, they definitely uh, have similar benefits, but what proof of stake chain does not have as a benefit is that if you start it and your token is worth zero value, how can you secure a chain with a stake that has no value, right? Because if the stake has no value, you're only relying purely on social consensus of people not uh, censoring transactions. Right. And so that's how that's why it's very very difficult to to start the proof of work proof of, proof of stake chain without any sort of value before. Like for example, with uh, with Pulse Chain, without uh, pre mining or yeah yeah. So with Pulse Chain, uh, Hex community, uh, they had the function for Hex. Uh, like for example, Hex probably was uh, you know used as as a deposit uh, sacrifice to get the points for a future PLS to be issued. So that worked where a chain tapped in into a community that already understood the, the storage of value principle. Mm. Um, but yeah, in our case, proof of work is really, really helpful because it already puts the fiat uh, uh, derived assets on the chain right away mm. without actually needing anybody to do any sort of black magic in terms of token trading. Mm. So. And that's, I think, unique because it's a combination of the staking and mining and all together, it's, it's actually a better system. And then it fits very well into the, the demand of uh, more compute. So you have a GPU network uh, that can be utilized um, and uh, providing value to that part of the ecosystem. Yeah, like everybody wants a GPU <coughs> to, to do their like stability. Uh, stable diffusion stuff, like let's say you want to make interesting AI art, so you can go and rent your GPUs from various providers, or potentially you can tap into our proof of work network and have uh, a miner accept a, uh, a task or a job and produce an output. Which is paid by uh, that mining's currency. So right, a... right, so, uh, so uh, yeah. So that currency that you mine, obviously, uh, you know, Xenium, you can use to to issue tasks to the GPU my GPU owners that could produce useful work. So super great too. Yeah. That's an example of an external AI application for the chain, which we'll have in the pretty much in the beginning. But what I'm super excited about is the internal AI consensus uh, manager that can learn about the blockchain and the network and conditions of the nodes and their proximity to each other and actually create the best consensus decisions based on the uh, ever-changing uh, information. Because nodes come and go. The network is heterogeneous. The name is there for a reason. Anybody can come up with any sort of hardware, be like in Alaska or whatever, right? What if there's like five nodes there? They probably should form a consensus uh, confederation. So an AI will be able to very, very quickly to come up with uh, decisions like that. Yeah. It analyzes the existing network, gets all of that data, uh, proposes uh, whoever's going to validate the next, uh, the next block. Uh, so it's sort of like uh, if you draw a parallel to Solana, they have a leader model. <clears throat> which is uh, set up transparent in a way in advance. So everyone knows who's going to validate the next block. Um, 
But that could be a potential. Well, the leaders don't validate. Leaders propose the block. They propose the blocks for others to vote on. Yeah, and so the others, uh, the other nodes, receive a block, uh, run uh, signature verifications, yeah. then announce to the rest of the network that they have done it, and then the rest of the nodes should add them as a validator, and they do it, I believe, until two thirds of all nodes have done it. And then the block or slot in Solana term is, is finalized. The problem there is that as the network grows to, let's say, like 10,000 nodes, each one of them will be rebroadcasting their decision on whether the block is valid or not. And it's n squared problem because for it's it's a thousand n squared. But then, but then let's say like 10 squared is only 100, but 100 squared it's all of a sudden like, you know, 10,000. Yeah. So as more validators come and join the network, there's more buzz on the network, there's there's more messages. Yeah, really. It slows for no, down consensus. Really for no reason. Really for no reason that uh, it's done that way. But there's no way to do it if, you do, if you're if you actually merging the settlement function and the actual execution function, you're putting it on the same layer. Um, which they call monolithic, but it just doesn't scale. So you really need to have just better algorithms to handle execution yeah. and settlement without waiting for the whole network to blow up with messages. Right. So, yeah, but it's like a problem pretty much with every chain. Yeah. So the same, the big O notion. Uh, so Solana and Phantom has um, uh, N2 squared. So uh, for each validator, it's just exponentially or quadratically yeah. uh, adds uh, complexity. Whereas you have uh, Bitcoin has uh, um, a straight uh, avalanche has a inverse logarithmic. Right. Uh, whereas we could achieve that linear. Yeah, linear, O1. Yeah. O1 means that uh, no matter how large the N is, which is the size of your network, the complexity of uh, coming up with consensus for a particular set of transactions on the block will never be more complicated than even if the network uh, gets larger by like 4x. So because of the committee size would, would be, it, it would be basically minimum number of nodes that would come up with a decision that we deem to be decentralized. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank All you right. very much, guys. All right, lecture's over. <laughs> <laughs>